Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Afterthoughts. My name is Wim Winters and tonight we have something to celebrate. The first recording of CPE Bach for this YouTube channel. And I'm very happy that I finally managed to do this. And it's not that I avoided the music of Immanuel Bach on purpose, but it just happened that it didn't fit into any schedule or any plans that I had. And frankly, I haven't played too much of his music in the past. On organ I did play some of his, his sonatas and on clavichord obviously I did play some music under which this upsheet from Silbermanism Clavier which we did tonight. So for those of you who haven't heard the original recording it's this famous Rondo by Immanuel Bach. So that's something we're going to talk about today and let's announce first that you might have seen that I've done a first tryout for a live stream so-called event on YouTube last week and that went fairly well. So what I will do is next week 25th, 25th of May at um, 9 p.m. that is Brussels time, that's I think GMT plus one. So that would, would allow um, my friends in the United States also to join to have a live session on this piece. So I will be, will be performing on Wednesday 25th of May 2016. So next week, Wednesday at 9 p.m. Um, Brussels time, this rondo and afterwards go through that complete piece reading your questions. So that will be the first official live stream for the practicing hours and with the purpose for that series of vlogs uh, on this moment for the um, Symphonias of Bach which we're going to study together from scratch um, this is a nice bridge to that so that would be a nice combination sometimes with the afterthoughts um, so put that in your in your agenda if you would like to join um, that it would be very nice and I'm excited to do that a little bit nervous as well but we just jump into that there is also on the internet on cpebach.org org there's a complete edition of uh, of his works it's like the neue Mozart Ausgabe you can just print the PDF scores online so it's available only if you want to buy the score of course the printed score uh, they charge you 25 dollar i think per volume which is of very reasonable and the introductions are very interested interesting as well so before diving into to that i reading all that there's one thing that I find remarkable is that CPE Bach, of course, as I said, is very much linked to the clavichord. He is seen as the high point of clavichord, and of course he was. But I strongly believe that CPE Bach, of course, was influenced by his father. It is so obvious that Bach on that field was an early adapter of this, these unfretted clavichords that gave so much expression. That was what they, look, what they were looking for in the 18th century and, and certainly in the work of G.S. Bach. So it would be very interesting, I think, to open this CPE Bach box to his father and just connect those two and not see the work of G.S. Bach separated from C.P.E. Bach, from his son. I think much that has been said and is being said on the relationship between C.P.E. Bach and the clavichord is also applicable to uh, G.S. Bach. And for those of you who don't know what this piece is about, the Abschied from Silbermanus und Klavier, that is a rondo that C.P.E. Bach, that Emanuel Bach wrote in 1781 when he gave or sold his clavichord, his Silbermann clavichord, to one of his students, Mr. Uh, Grothuis. I hope I pronounce his name correct. Anyway, he lived somewhere near Riga and visited Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach, uh, had some lessons probably, and heard him play. And 
to his surprise, is, as he wrote in a letter, he not only heard the master play on his praised instrument by then by many musicians and Emmanuel Bach's clavichord was a kind of pièce unique, so to say, but he could he, he just took it, he, he, C.P. Bach gave it to him, or sold it to him. So he wrote, literally, and that is Grotius I'm uh, citing, quoting form of introduction from this uh, uh, complete edition. So, quote, after I had the unforgettable pleasure of meeting C.P. Bach during a trip to Germany, he left me his clavichord, and between brackets here is clavier, because that's the, that's the uh, term that is used in, in the German text, which is very interesting, we come back on that in a minute, which a famous Mr. Silberman had built for him, and which already therefore has to strike every connoisseur as remarkable. But in addition, I had heard it praised by many great keyboard virtuosos as the best instrument of its kind, and it had been played by such a great master for 34 years, 35 years, which doubled its value for me, which I can imagine, of course. And by the way, officially, there is no Silberman clavichord survived, and also not the, uh, the instrument of C.P.E. Bach. I continue because it's interesting. For 15 years, I had harbored the wish in my heart merely to see this excellent instrument. And all of a sudden, so imagine what, in, what, what the clavichord was at that time. So here you have this baron in Riga sitting, waiting for 15 years just to hear an instrument and not a, not a kind of instrument, a, a clavichord. So finally it happened. And all of a sudden, I had seen it, had heard it, and heard a Bach play on it, and found myself the owner of this treasure. I don't know which good spirit brought me this fortune, which so many of Bach's friends had desired in vain. That's true. Even Mozart, some years later, would in vain try to buy the clavichord that once belonged probably to G.S. Bach, and which was in the possession of, and I forget the name, one of uh, the successors of Bach in Leipzig, uh, maybe the name will. He, he, would, he was not. To, it, that instrument was not for sale with uh, too much regret of Mozart. So I don't know which good spirit brought me this fortune with so many Bach's prints and so. This much is certain. It seems like it seemed like I had received all the joys of life from his hands. He, however, felt like a father who had given away his beloved daughter. He was pleased, as him, he himself put it, to see it in good hands. Yet, as he had sent it off, he was overcome by a wistfulness as if the father was parting from his daughter. The following rondo is evidence of this, which he sent to me in a letter with these words. And then he's quoting C.P. Bach. Here you receive my darling, in order that this sonata may fall only into your hands, I copied it out myself from my first draft. It stands as proof that it is possible also to compose a mournful rondo, and it cannot be played on any other clavichord than on the one you possess." End of quote. So that's something. In my initial delight about the clavichord I had received, I composed the subsequent rondo and sent this attempt as, at expressing my joy to Bach as a souvenir. So, what he means by that, this Mr. Grotus is at his turn when he was back in Riga with, with the Bach clavichord, he composed his own rondo and sent it to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, which is also included in the score, but it's a very known piece. It is thus that these two rondos were created as a commemoration of our friendship and that this note was written for a better insight into their performance. So writes Mr. Grothus of 30 September 1781, and he would die only one year later, if I remember well. So C.P.E. Bach would survive him, and that left his instrument in the hand of a young man who would die soon after. So um, 
then they continue in this introduction that, and that's interesting that there is n that there is no manuscript and not a copy survived, and at this time, this instrument has disappeared forever. <coughs> As it looks, it was taken to Riga to one of to a castle there, and as with the Second World War, with many castles that they just empty them in case of something would happen, probably it's possible that the instrument of Bach, the clavichord, was still there somewhere. And who knows that today that instrument is still somewhere in a hidden uh, place of a museum or a bunker or I don't know what. So let's dream and let's hope that this instrument once just come in the hands of see daylight again. And that's uh, wishful thinking, I think. So going to the the work of Annette Richards, uh, I was telling you about Annette, and she not only directed um, one very interesting book full of full of articles around CPE Bach studies. She also wrote a thesis uh, with the title the, Tree, the Free Fantasia and the Musical Picturesque. And in that thesis she, had, she has one chapter on the solitude and the clavichord culture, the clavichord cult, so to say. And that's a very interesting passage. Again, I read that also with different eyes than I would read it 10 years ago. Again, I would love to see um, from a, a pen like that of Annette's to see a connection between G.S. Bach and C.P.E. Bach, but because I strongly believe that the clavichord was in, in the center of the heart of uh, G.S. Bach. And by the way, there is of course no quote by Bach himself. And imagine that we would have a description of G.S. Bach's clavichord as we have from C.P.E. Bach's clavichord, and we're coming to that in a second. Then, then the importance, and that's what I wanted to say, the importance of clavichords in the work of G.S. Bach would have been so incredibly much greater and probably people like Dolmetsch in early 20th century wouldn't have lost, so to say, their battle against uh, players like Wandowska. With all respect, but I, I see that there is a division between vi two visions and that the, the, the Dolmetsch division, vision, which I believe, and I, I'm not a specialist in Dolmetsch, uh, you go to the Facebook uh, group of uh, clavichord and you, you encounter people who are so incredibly uh, informed on that, that uh, you should ask probably there, but I think that Dolmetsch point was really that the clavichord was much more important in Bach's work than we see today. Um, what Annette is, is doing is quoting some sources and I, of course, Bernie, we all know Charles Bernie with his journey to, throughout Europe. He was visiting Emmanuel Bach and he heard him play. But also there was a certain Mr. Reichardt. He visited Bach in Hamburg in 1774, so a few years before that. And what he writes is, what he wrote is very interesting because he said that the instrument was capable of sustaining the sound for the duration of six quavers in a slow tempo, which is of course very long. I, I must say that this clavichord is capable of the same, certainly in the bass, if I, if I press a note and we will count. That's about 10 seconds in, in, uh, in 60, say 10 seconds and in, the, in the treble. Four or five seconds. seconds. Interesting enough, uh, Turk will write in his Klavierschule in 1789 that the, one of the, of the um, criteria to decide whether a clavichord is good or not, or just mediocre is just the length of note and then the, the length of tone that it has and that's of course incredibly important um, and then that 
this instrument which could take fortissimos that would destroy another instrument and pianissimos which on any other would never sound and that is so important a quote because when i played beethoven on this instrument and i had chords like in the pathetic and it was that's really fortissimo then sometimes it's it's unlike many other clavichords and I do realize that that in the treble of this instrument is incredibly strong in the treble. Your Spotflieger's instrument are famous for that but this is, an, this is exceptional and that's the reason why I can play music that's that late but and also playing very soft so having a very very uh, good resistance of sound as, as I call it so but at the same time also very 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 soft with have without losing the quality of tone and that's demonstrated very good in this piece i don't know if we have time for that to, because otherwise it will be maybe next week to demonstrate that when you go to the treble I, um, You can go very soft. Oh. So there's a flexibility in tone there. And that's writing here. That's, you, that's writing that. So the element of power of a clavichord, which is today maybe not seen as a real quality of a clavichord, I'm convinced that in the 80th and 80th century that was one of the criteria as also Gottlob Turk is writing but also Adlung is writing in 1722 that's in his book uh, where he talks about organs and also on clavichords and it's only published I think uh, after his death but it's an early work 1722 and that's all the same period where Bach starts with the Voltempreite Clavier di Partitas and with I think with these kinds of instruments um, that the power that an instrument can deliver in clavichord is one of the main criteria and so but today if I, I see and that's not a remark it's just something that we might have to adjust that it is so difficult to, to, to build a clavichord that has a, has a kind of power and this of course is not near what a harpsichord produces but measured at 75 dB, that is quite something. That is so the dynamic range of this instrument between 45 and 75 dB. That is that is that's quite loud. Um, that is a quality actually, and we I think we should should strive to uh, for that in general. Stay in the sound for the duration of six quavers in a slow tempo with all manner of shadings of swelling and ebbing both in the bass and in the treble but this is only possible so Reichardt insists on his very beautiful Silbermann clavichord so I think we all can agree that Mr. Silbermann was must have been one of the most illustrious clavichord builders so to conclude this session and again I will do a live YouTube session next Wednesday 25th of May at 9 p.m. To go together with you live through this piece i will play it for you and then we'll analyze that read your questions live as we go through that if you have any so that's that's the time to ask of just uh, and i don't have answers to all actually i can only give kind of interpretation but that's maybe interesting to you um, and to conclude this uh, afterthoughts without much playing but I always wondered and that's something I want to share with you that question why that it is a pity that uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and Karl Philipp Emanuel Bach never met uh, it would have been wonderful to see that instrument go in the hands of Mozart who one year later 1782 came to Vienna and actually quite soon there met Baron von Swieten which was very influential, influential there in Vienna 
uh, not only to Mozart but also to Beethoven and von Swieten of course was a was very much related to Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and through him Mozart was introduced to the work of G.S. Bach and Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach and it's just a pity that those two geniuses want because Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach was really a genius as a composer that they never have, have met. Okay, that's another, that's another series of vlogs that's coming up that will be your, your time Q&A and I think on Wednesday also will be the first one. Okay, when I, I'm being attacked by flies or some kind of thing, so that's time to end. Um, thank you for watching. It was not a lot of music. Again, that will be in the live session and that will go on YouTube also as a, as a single, as an, as an independent video. So don't worry if you cannot attend that meeting, you will be able to catch up later on YouTube itself. Thank you for watching and for subscribing to this channel as always and sharing this video with your friends and we see each other very soon again. Bye. Mm -hmm.